Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Ray from the Bloomfield Public Library. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're really excited to have um, what I now call our annual Trails Day program. Um, so I'm just going to kick off the program by sharing my screen with you because we have added something to our library of things that you may be interested in. We added a hiking kit, um, which you can see this is my little promo with my coworker, Victor, that we took some fun pictures. And in this hiking kit that you can check out with your library card, um, we have um, a birding guide, we have some maps, we have um, binoculars, a compass, headlamps, a GPS, um, and all comes in a convenient backpack. Um, so this is available at the library. Um, if it's checked out, you can put it on hold, um, but you do have to pick it up at Bloomfield and it goes out for two weeks. So this is just one of our many steps um, and adding to our library of things. Some of our other library of things includes our Chromebooks and hotspots. Um, and there are libraries that have baking pans and drills and things like that. So again, with your, with your library card, if you don't have a library card, but you live in Connecticut, you get them in the hometown wherever you live. And then it works at all the public libraries in the state. Everything is free. Um, come visit us in Bloomfield if you're not here already. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. I'll include um, the link to it in case you want to put it in hold on hold as a part of our follow-up email. And we'll also include this recording on our YouTube channel under our environmental um, playlist. So I will send everybody the link to that too. So I'm going to turn this directly over to Eric to get us started on the presentation. Thanks very much, Sarah. And thanks for putting together that amazing hiking kit. What a great thing to do for uh, residents of Bloomfield uh, to enjoy the outdoors. Yeah, I couldn't help but uh, notice that one of the things in the kit was you know, some New England trail maps and a New England trail brochure. And that's all, you know, the, the kind of stuff that uh, we've actually worked to produce those and uh, have them available in our office. And um, that that is one of the things we work on too. So I'm glad that the town of Bloomfield is on top of it, thanks to you. Um, so th thank you for um, inviting us, you know, once again, to talk a little bit about some of the state parks and amazing natural resources in uh, the Bloomfield area. Um, you know, my name is Eric Hammerling. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, and I'll, I'll jump right in, give you a little bit of history and uh, background on the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. We're, we're actually the oldest uh, nonprofit conservation organization established in Connecticut. Um, this was in 1895, and we were founded right next door to Bloomfield in Simsbury. And uh, I always love this photo because um, you can see that when people went for a walk in the woods, they may be dressed a little bit more formally than we do today, but uh, th this was actually a um, CFPA field meeting at the First State Forest um, in Portland. But at, at that time in 1895, you know, we, we think about things today, um, but it's nice to have some perspective of, you know, looking back 128 years ago. And, um, you know, that was a time where one of the major concerns that we had as a state was uh, deforestation. Um, and forest management um, was really not well done at the time. And there was no science uh, of forest management. Another issue that we had in Connecticut, which seems a little bit odd today, perhaps, um, was we had forest fires um, that would, you know, rage across sections of, of the state. Um, in fact, uh, there was a report in, in 1894, Connecticut's air was yellow with smoke from local fires uh, that were also combined with big fires in Michigan, Minnesota, and Canada that were uh, affecting, you know, our air quality here. Um, and at the time, you know, one of the big things that CFPA was involved in was actually forest fire prevention. And this is a brochure from the time, you know, uh, fire the outlaw, don't turn him loose in the woods. Uh, fire was often described at the time as kind of a, a red wolf. Um, and it's just kind of interesting, like today, we would love to have red wolves in Connecticut, but, um, you know, at that time, uh, red wolves were, were the enemy. And one of the things that was probably most responsible for fires at the time were uh, actually the trains. Um, and there were sparks that would come out of the locomotive smokestacks that would create fires. And, and part of the reason that these were such a problem 
is they would often create a fire in a place where there are very few people around to respond. And so what uh, the, the trains, um, one of CFPA's first advocacy efforts was a 30-year-long battle with um, you know, the, the railroad companies to try to get spark arresters put on locomotive uh, smokestacks. Um, we were eventually successful with that, but what the railroads would do in the interim is they would, you know, sometimes in a preventive mode, would burn area uh, right next to the train tracks to uh, try to make sure that it wouldn't uh, turn into a wildfire. And in 1895, there were no state parks or forests. You know, we take that for granted today. We have 110 state parks, 32 state forests, uh, 92 wildlife management areas. You know, these places didn't exist. Uh, there weren't those places for the public to go and recreate outdoors. And today, we are in a much better place. There also weren't uh, many environmental laws at the time, but you know, one of the things that was an early uh, mission focus for CFPA was to try to protect land uh, in different areas for the public to enjoy and to see things like uh, forest management done well in state forests. And these are a number of the um, state parks that and, and for us that CFPA was involved with helping to um, establish going back to the very beginning. You can see some pretty amazing places here. There are several others that CFPA was very involved in, but some of my favorites are ones that we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, and those are at Our Farm State Park Scenic Reserve, at Penwood State Park, and at Talcott Mountain State Park. Uh, a little bit more about CFPA, you know, um, we have four different programs that we deliver for the public. Uh, we, we typically use a, a really nice uh, outdoorsy acronym of ACRE because we do advocacy, conservation, recreation, education. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things we do. Um, I, I won't go deeply into this because I'll, I'll get right to talking a bit more about some of the amazing resources you have in Bloomfield. Um, but in, on the advocacy side, both at the state level and the federal level, we work on various issues related to forest parks and trails. And some of you might be familiar with the uh, Passport to the Parks program in Connecticut. That's something that we were a primary advocate for. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, in terms of conservation, we're actually a statewide land trust. We have about 2,000 acres of property in various parts of the state that we either own or hold conservation easements on. And one of the things that's unique about our relationship with our farm scenic reserve, uh, or I should say our park state, our, our farm state park scenic reserve is the official name in Bloomfield. Uh, we hold a conservation easement on that property that's also a state park, uh, you know, owned and run by the state. And the purpose of the easement is to try to make sure that there are certain activities that are um, you know, allowed and some not allowed. Uh, and you know, we're responsible as an organization to work with the state to make sure that it's always furthering uh, the, the, the reasons for why it was established. One of the things that we're probably best known for as an organization is the 825 plus miles of Blue Blaze hiking trails all around the state. You know, of course, you're familiar with the Metacomet Trail, uh, which is part of the New England National Scenic Trail in Bloomfield. But um, you know, there are all these different trails around the state that are worth exploring. We publish the Connecticut Walk Book uh, with maps of all of those great places. Also in the recreation side of things, uh, we host the annual celebration of Trails Day every year. And this is the 30th anniversary this year of, of Connecticut Trails Day. Uh, that's coming up on June 3rd and 4th. And just, um, you know, if you were to go to the website trailsday.org, you can see almost 200 events uh, that are organized like this in little cards uh, alphabetically uh, by town. And I just kind of highlighted the three events that are happening in Bloomfield for uh, during Trails Day weekend at Wilk Wilcox Park, at Seabury, um, and at our farm, uh, both Scenic Reserve at the 4-H and at the MDC right next door. 
Uh, we also have education programs that we do on an ongoing basis. And this is a program uh, out in Wyndham with the Wyndham Middle School. And uh, for, for now seven years, we've been uh, doing programs with the Wyndham Middle School uh, at Goodwin State Forest. But let's talk about Bloomfield. Um, so, you know, here's, here's a map of Bloomfield. And I just wanted to, um, you, when you think about Bloomfield, you may not always uh, also quickly say, this is a you know, nationally recognized outdoor recreation hotspot. You may not think that about Bloomfield. You may take for granted the special place where, where you live. However, um, if you put it in context, you have one wild and scenic river, you have one national scenic trail, one of only 11 national scenic trails in the United States. You have three state parks, which are fantastic uh, state parks, in addition to the town parks and land trust properties and working farms, um, and you know, a whole host of local organizations that are doing really good work um, on you know, getting people outdoors, uh, conservation of uh, waterways and uh, land. And of course, the town of Bloomfield is really terrific at um, helping with, uh, you know, recreational services for the public. So, you know, if you weren't already thinking, wow, about the uh, resources available in Bloomfield, I, I hope you'll think that way soon. So let, let's talk about the different aspects of that. You know, one wild and scenic river, um, you know, some of you may know uh, that, you know, the Farmington River in the northern part of uh, town here uh, that may have popped off the edge of the screen. <laughs> um, that's the uh, Farmington River. And, uh, you know, along with Salmon Brook, which is one of its uh, major tributaries, it was designated as wild and scenic in uh, March of 2019. Um, if this is the entire Farmington River watershed, um, and here is Bloomfield, just uh, so you can see it there. And when I think about the Farmington River watershed and its relationship to Bloomfield, I usually think about, you know, here's this uh, amoeba-like uh, thing uh, with this little arm tucked around Bloomfield. It's, it's a way of showing affection for Bloomfield as, as a neighboring watershed. And, and actually, Bloomfield has two watersheds uh, that it's a part of. It's both a part of the Farmington River watershed in the north um, and to the south and east, it's part of the Park River watershed that some of you may uh, uh, know about. You know, it drains into the Park River, which drains into the Connecticut River. Um, and again, uh, some really special resources here. So one national scenic trail. Um, some of you may uh, see this without my highlighting it, but you know, up on the ridge line is the Metacomet Trail, um, which is part of the New England National Scenic Trail that, that will also sometimes you'll hear it referred to as, as the net. Um, as I mentioned, it's one of only 11 uh, National Scenic tra Trails in the country. And you know, locally, the uh, Winterberry Land Trust, which some of you may know has now become a regional land trust. Um, it's united with the West Hartford Land Trust and the East Granby Land Trust to become the Trap Rock Ridge Land Conservancy. Um, but they have been uh, really dedicated to looking at connecting trails to the New England National Scenic Trail. And you know they've worked on this uh, East-West La Salette Trail uh, right, right through town. Uh, if you're interested in the the big national scenic trail, you know the whole extent of it, and of course, you know Bloomfield is is right around here uh, on the trail. Um, it stretches from uh, Long Island Sound and Guilford all the way up to the New Hampshire border, about 235 miles. You know, you may have seen a trail marker at at Penwood that looks like this. Um, and you know, if you're interested in more information about the New England Trail. There's a great website that, that we uh, put together along with our partners at the National Park Service um, and the Appalachian Mountain Club at uh, newenglandtrail.org where you can find out all sorts of things about the New England Trail. All right, and then um, perhaps what you all are most interested in is uh, you know, your three state parks uh, in, in Bloomfield, you know, all within 10 minutes of, of Prosser Library. 
so, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, we have 110 state parks, 32 state forests, 92 wildlife management areas, um, and, you know, other state facilities like boat launches covering over, you know, 250,000 uh, acres across the state. Every resident of Connecticut lives within a 15 minute drive of at least one of these state amenities. Uh, but in Bloomfield, you live within 10 minutes of at least three. And I, I'd say there are probably others uh, just, a, you know, a couple minutes away as well. And Steph can talk about some of those. Um, uh, Steph is the uh, park supervisor at, uh, at DEEP, who's responsible for uh, all of the parks in our area. But I'll talk a little bit about the history of, of those three parks because uh, they're intimately involved with uh, actually CFPA's history. So first up uh, is Penwood State Park. Uh, you may recognize this black uh, from you know, near the entrance, uh, near the parking area or you know, the view of Lake Louise or view from the Trap Rock Ridge. Um, but this park was, um, oh, and the plaque, which is a little hard to read, it says, uh, Penwood donated to the people of Connecticut as a state park by Curtis H. Veter, a great lover of nature in 1944. So let me tell you a little bit about Curtis Veter um, because he was a fascinating, Person. Um, and if you, you went on, on to the CFPA website and looked at old, uh, you know, quarterly magazines of ours uh, called Connecticut Woodlands, the fall 2013 issue has a feature on Curtis Veter that talks a lot about his life. Um, and that's fascinating as well. But, uh, you know, briefly, he, uh, Curtis was on the board of CFPA from 1915 until his death in 1943. He was an engineer, a uh, prolific inventor, who attained his first patent at the age of 18. And he became particularly well known for making gadgets that served as counters. So here you can see a few. Um, this odometer on, uh, for a bicycle was something that he developed called the cyclometer, which made him uh, somewhat legendary in the cycling community. Um, and there, you know, you can just imagine all the different manufacturing processes that rely on, you know, what became beater root um, counters. So voting machines, cash registers, and, you know, here's uh, just an example of a, a gasoline dispenser, like this uh, gas tank monitor. So um, probably not surprising to any of you that uh, Mr. Beater made a lot of money uh, with some of his inventions. And uh, you know, good for all of us because you know that made him able to you know donate the land uh, to the state for uh, the state park, and he also donated his home, which uh, might look familiar to some of you. Um, you know, that is uh, in Hartford. It's the the home of the Connecticut Historical Society on Elizabeth Street, just off Asylum Avenue. But that's where Curtis Veter lived, um, and you know, when he passed away, he passed on to the state, uh, you know, 787 acres of land uh, and his Bloomfield home uh, in, in his will. Just thank you very much, Curtis. I'm going to talk a little bit about Talcott Mountain State Park. Um, you know, it's a very different story for how Talcott Mountain became uh, a state park. Uh, this was not a generous gift uh, to the state. This was actually, um, and, you know, and of course, if you've been to uh, Hugh Blind or High Blind Tower, depending on uh, how you uh, like to pronounce it, you know, you can see, you know, up at the top of this 165 foot uh, tower, amazing 360 degree views uh, that you could see uh, to Long Island Sound or up into Massachusetts on a clear day. Um, but this land where Talcott Mountain State Park is, is currently, almost became a housing subdivision. And some of you may uh, remember this. So in, in 1962, uh, a housing subdivision was proposed for, for the mountain. And in response, a Save Talcott Mountain Committee was started under the leadership of uh, Buist Anderson, who lived on Gale Road in Bloomfield and was also active keeping billboards off of scenic roads. That was a, another one of his um, kind of advocacy uh, loves. 
But the, South, the Save Talcott Mountain Committee included people active in uh, the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, the Farmington River Watershed Association, and several local community leaders. Um, to help raise funding to protect Talcott Mountain, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving put forward a challenge grant of $50,000 which was matched by funds raised by FRW, the Farmington River Watershed Association, Connecticut Forest and Park Association, to put together $150,000, which doesn't sound like a lot of money, but at the time, the purchase cost uh, for the land and the, the, uh, the tower was $500,000. Uh, so it, it, it cost $500,000 to save the mountain in 1965. And it's amazing to think, uh, I don't think anyone has ever regretted that we spent what seemed like a large amount of money at the time, but today we say, thank goodness, um, people can serve this special place. And then lastly, um, you know, Our Farm State Park Scenic Reserve, uh, and you can actually see Hugh Line Tower off in the distance here, um, you know, right, right at the ridge. Uh, this is, and, and other, uh, you know, and the, the, actually the state's newest state park, which was donated to the state in uh, December of 2014. This is actually a uh, walk during Connecticut Trails Day, um, where folks were looking for bobolinks on this hill. But this park, which is about 40 acres, was donated to the state by uh, Beth Shiro, who is granddaughter of Beatrice Fox Auerbach who once had a summer retreat uh, residence on the property. Uh, there are no buildings that remain today. Um, and the park is somewhat unique, as, as I mentioned earlier, in that uh, before donating the uh, land to the state, uh, Ms. Shiro also denied, donated a conservation easement to CFPA. And that was to try to protect certain uses and restrictions in, in the park forever. Um, this park is all about beautiful views. Um, you, you obviously can see the Metacomet Ridgeline, um, and it's next to, uh, not surprisingly, uh, land owned by the 4-H Education Center at Our Farm, uh, which was also a gift from the family of Beatrice Fox Auerbach. Here's uh, kind of an aerial view uh, of, you know, if, if you've come in on Our Farm Road and we're going to 4-H, you know, down the road, you may have seen a little parking area here, and then there's a little uh, road that you can walk up, uh, not drive up, uh, to get to the summit of this, you know, beautiful uh, park. Um, th this is uh, one of the things I'll just mention here quickly, and uh, Hillary will talk a little bit about this too, is, you know, one of the ways that uh, we wanted to make sure that this special place was always protected uh, forever, was we established a friends group, uh, the Friends of Our Farm Scenic Reserve, uh, which is a bunch of volunteers who you know get together uh, you know periodically every month or two with uh, with Stephanie, um, the park supervisor, to uh, figure out how we can be helpful. Uh, sometimes it's you know a real hands-on projects. Sometimes it's uh, helping to raise money for various things. But uh, if you're interested, and there are lots of different um, events that are uh, ongoing and things that um, we, we can talk some more about uh, as we go. So uh, quickly, I just wanted to leave you with two, two challenges looking forward uh, that I hope you'll uh, you know, find a way to get engaged in. You know, obviously there are some amazing resources in Bloomfield that are here you know, for you to enjoy. Um, but these challenges are things that you can help us all with. Um, so you know, the first challenge is to make sure that we're supporting funding and field staff to maintain state parks. Uh, one thing that you may not know is that you know, we have 110 state parks, but we only have uh, 83 full-time staff to care for them. Uh, and despite the fact that we have, you know, a good number of seasonal workers that, uh, you know, come for a part of the year to help with maintenance, who is going to recruit and train and ensure that, uh, you know, the work is done appropriately and sometimes, unfortunately, having to let people go and find new people and, you know, all of that falls on the shoulders of, you know, 83 uh, 
staff who are you know responsible like Stephanie as the park supervisor you know she has a lot of things that she has responsibilities for um, we have been advocating at CFPA and also with uh, our friends at the Friends of Connecticut State Parks for uh, 15 new park maintainers uh, in the budget. Uh, they're actually this year in the legislature, uh, they proposed 15 new park maintainers in the budget. Um, and we have to uh, all advocate in the next few weeks while they're figuring out the state budget um, to uh, hopefully have those 15 park maintainers stay in the budget. Um, we also want to protect the passport to the parks, which for some of you, um, if you've been to, uh, say, a, a shoreline park that charges a fee or uh, even, uh, you know, local parks that may charge a fee to uh, people from out of state, um, you as a Connecticut resident no longer pay a fee at the gates to state parks because of the passport to the parks. And that's a program that we all contribute to when we register our uh, motor vehicles. It's a you know five dollar per year fee that we pay right up front. That helps to fund all of the parks for for everyone. And then lastly, you know, uh, if if you can find a way to as a second challenge, find a way to disconnect from digital and reconnect to the outdoors. Um, that's one of the, the greatest challenges that as a, as a parent, I feel like I have. Um, and uh, as someone who cares about, you know, people being connected to the outdoors, uh, it is a major challenge. Just as an example, this uh, chart here, which may be a little hard to read, um, is showing you starting in 2008, going through 2017, and kind of really continuing to through this last year, looking at the hours uh, per day that are spent online. And, it, you know, it was 2.7 2 hours online in 2008. Today, it's 6 point, let's say 6.6 .6 hours a day that's being spent online. And you can see this growing uh, top piece here is phones. So there is, um, you know, an awful lot of people looking at their phones and sometimes forgetting to get outdoors. There are all sorts of problems associated with more screen time. You know, I, I won't go too deeply into this, but I'll, I'll really say there is an antidote uh, to some of these problems. And there have actually been some studies done that say all you need to do is find two hours a week to get outside and connect to the land. Two hours a week. It could be two hours all at once. It could be, you know, three minute, three visits of forty minutes, or you know, four half an hour uh, excursions. Two hours a week really makes a difference, and it strongly correlates with feeling better. And in fact, you know, here it's that shouldn't be a big surprise because when you are spending time outdoors, uh, there are all these positive things that happen to your, your body and you could feel it, right? Lower stress, lower blood pressure and heart rate, um, you know, feeling better, actually being healthier, recovering more quickly from illnesses. Um, they did an interesting study, in fact, that you know, just to be in a hospital room that has a window that looks out at nature, people recover from illnesses much faster than if you just have a wall there. So it, there's something magical there that we need to make sure we tap into. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, wrap things there and turn, turn them over to uh, Hillary Silver, who is um, you know, the current uh, chair of uh, the, the steering committee that's working at uh, our, the Friends of Our Farm Scenic Reserve. So I'll stop sharing and turn it over to you, Hillary. Oh, you're muted, Hillary. I'm Hillary Silver. I'm uh, the current chair of the uh, Friends of Our Farm State Park Scenic Reserve. We meet every month or two. We try to figure out ways to um, help the uh, new state park be well run and well used. We try to think of new ways to get people to be involved and enjoy it. One of them is that we now have is I guess it's once a year we have a librarian come and read books or somebody come and read books and a bunch of kids come up to the top of the mountain and if it's nice whether they read books and they might have some apple juice or something like that and the idea is to just get more people enjoying the space 
Um, yeah, we meet every month or two with Stephanie, who you're going to talk to, ne to here next. And let me tell you about some events that are coming up. As Eric may have mentioned, there's an event called Connecticut Trails, Connecticut Trails Day. And it's actually two days. It's June 3rd and 4th. We're having an event June 4th at 4.30. And folks are welcome to come join us. You can go to, I think it's trailsday.org. I think we put the link in the, in the chat already. And in addition, we do a book, we're doing a book reading program with younger members. We think it's going to be on June 22nd. People who have kids are welcome to bring their kids and come up to the top of the mountain, weather permitting, and uh, have fun. Yeah, so it says it's 10 a.m. on Thursday, June 22nd, so just after school gets out. So it's maybe before people are heading off wherever they're heading or before they're starting their programs, or maybe they can just come. And it's fun for the kids, and it's a great way to see the park if you haven't seen it. We're also planning to do, we, we tried to do a spring, spring um, work day that didn't work, it rained. So we're going to try to do either summer or fall work day, our committee will, to maybe help prune some trees or uh, do different things to help keep the uh, park a little in better shape. And we recently made a connecting trail between um, our farm, between the scenic reserve and the 4-H farm that a lot of you know about and um, something that connects to uh, Talcott Mountain. So we're going to work on getting that identified and blazed so people know where to walk. And there's information about, about the Friends of, more about the park on the Friends of the CFPA website. And I can post the URL or Eric can for the offensive scenic reserve page in the chat if you want, want it. And folks should follow up with you, um, with me or with CFPA um, to learn more about the scenic reserve. And it's really close to all of you and it's a beautiful place. And we were there once we had a meeting on a day that felt not very cool, lower down, but when you get up there, there's some breezes. So in the summer when it's hot, the breezes are then also there. And somebody on our committee who Eric mentioned actually got married on top of the mountain. And it's a lovely place. And I encourage you to check it out. And now I'm going to mention, I'm now I'm going to welcome Stephanie Dozant, who's the park supervisor for the Our Farm Scenic Reserve, Penwood, Talcott Mountain, and some other state parks in the area. And I will put the link in for um, Our Farm State Reserve. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Eric. I'm so happy to be here with you guys again this year. This is our second year doing the Zoom call. Um, hopefully one year we'll be able to do it in person, which would be amazing, maybe in a couple of years. Um, but yeah, so again, my name is Stephanie. I'm a Park and Recreation Supervisor with the State of Connecticut at Penwood Management Unit. With um, So right now I manage many different parks, many different state forests, wildlife management areas and boat launches, as Eric kind of stated earlier. Um, I've been working with state of Connecticut. When I started, I was 18 years old. So quite a while ago, um, I was a seasonal park ranger over east in Salmon River State Forest. Um, it was absolutely awesome. I got hooked on it. I absolutely loved going out, interacting with the public, um, doing many different activities, working with the um, maintainer staff, things like that, and just fell in love with Connecticut State Parks. Um, so I was hired here as a full-time staff member in 2019. And I actually started at Burr Pond State Park in um, Torrington, which isn't too far away. So if you've been over there, there's a lot of really cool areas such as um, Burr Pond, Haystack, Dennis Hill, couple other parks over there too. So definitely go over and check those out. Um, so within the Bloomfield area, I get to manage Talcott Mountain, as Eric said, Penwood, and then Aro Farm State Park Scenic Reserve. So within this unit, I have around 5,000 acres that I manage. It's definitely a lot. It's a lot of fun. It definitely keeps me busy and active. Um, and there's a little bit of everything. So surrounding Bloomfield, um, that's where our main shop is out of. I have towns such as Avon, Simsbury, Farmington, West Hartford, Windsor, Windsor Locks, Suffield, Granby, Plainville, and finally Bloomfield. So there's definitely a big area to take care of. Um, but again, it just means there's a lot of variety and I get to drive around the state quite a bit, So, which is great. So some of our bigger parks that we take care of are the three that I mentioned, and then Strattonbrook and Simsbury, which isn't too far away, um, Horse Guard in Avon, again, not too far from you guys, 
Windsor Locks Canal Trail in Windsor, and then there's a Suffield side. And finally, Windsor Boat Launch, Rainbow Boat Launch, which isn't too far from Bloomfield either, uh, Great Pond, State Forest, and Simsbury, and many more. So there's definitely a lot that we take care of. And if you haven't been kind of explored out of Bloomfield, definitely take the time and do so. So as a park and recreation supervisor, it is my job to manage all the state forests and state parks. It requires a lot of planning, great time management, and a variety of skills, some things that I did not even expect me to learn how to do, and now I love doing them. So I've learned how to operate chainsaws, tractors, chippers, landscaping equipment. Um, this week, I was doing plumbing for four days because that's what I know how to do now, which is amazing. <laughs> um, on top of doing electrical work, we maintain all of our own facilities, all the properties, all the grounds, and we just wanna make sure it's safe for you guys to come out and explore. Um, each year, I am able to hire 23 seasonals. It got upped a little bit from last year, which is amazing. And within the whole entire state of Connecticut, there's over 500. So when you, either if you have kids or if you're getting to that age where you're gonna be 18 soon, definitely apply, come work for us, come work for me. I would love to have you. Um, and I fill a lot of different positions such as maintainers, park rangers, interpreters, and I have one ticket booth attendant. So we hire most of our seasonals and high school, college students. And then a lot of people who have retired and they just kind of want to give back and kind of get back into nature. We love having them too. So while working with my seasonal staff, and my two full-time maintainers is a lot, we also get to work with the public every single day. It is without a doubt the best part of the job because even on your best days, it feels amazing. And even on the worst days where you have to tell someone no, you still know you're kind of protecting the natural resources. So I get to answer a lot of questions about park closures, openers, opens, trails, activities, and just trying to keep everyone safe and teach them how to recreate properly within the state parks. Um, I get to inform a lot of people on rules and regulations, dogs off leash, things like that. And then we have, um, we actually have two pavilions, one in Bloomfield, which is at Penwood State Park, and then one at Strattonbrook, where you can actually rent for family get togethers, parties, and you can do that all through Reserve America. And I can link that below. Um, and so those are all, you can rent them from May 1st until um, October, mid-October, I think I closed them up, but definitely take advantage of them. It's a great opportunity to have a family get together in a big, beautiful area. And there's so many activities within each park that you can kind of take advantage during that time. I also get to support different organizations such as RO Farm Scenic Reserve um, with their friends group, the friends group of uh, Hugh Blind Tower, and then the friends group at Windsor Locks Canal Trail. Um, we also work with many trail organizations, CFPA. Um, we work with Boy, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, different schools. So we definitely get to kind of come in contact with everyone across the state. Thank you, Eric. Um, and so I get to communicate with everyone. I get to attend meetings and just help everyone kind of make sure we're all meeting that same mutual goal of protecting these natural resources and the facilities. Um, so we have a lot of different events that take place within our state parks. Um, each state park has kind of, we kind of plan different events that are gonna be able to be used for activities that we support. So um, at Penwood, there's a lot of trail races, things like that. There's a lot of hiking events, bird watching. And then um, this upcoming weekend at Strattenbrook State Park, we actually have families in the, um, families in the park and it's a wellness day. So there'll be many different groups, including Simsbury Library. There'll be um, our fire, our, I believe the fire department and police departments coming by. We have our MCON officers, which environmental conservation police coming and joining. We have a storybook read. We have a table about bears to educate everyone about bears. We know we love them in Bloomfield and Simsbury. We have so many of them. Um, and then there's many different activities. We have sports that you can play. Um, and there's so many things. So last year, I think we had 150 people 
hopefully we don't get the rain that's supposed to be coming this weekend and hopefully it will have a good turnout. Um, but that is all with no child left inside. So make sure that you take a look at their website or on our social media and just keep up to date. We have, we've been working with them or they're part of the DEP, but I work with them quite often to make sure that we're having enough events across the whole entire state. And it gets everyone to get out and go to different state parks too. So it's a great program. Um, we have other events like um, Hillary was talking about at RO Farm Senior Reserve. Thank you. And Talbot Mountain State Park has events, including their Hike to the Mic in Tower Toot, um, which Hike to the Mic is in August, Tower Two is in October, and those both support that friends group. Um, so every single day, my job is a little different. Um, today, I was able to do some emails. Yesterday, I was doing plumbing. Tomorrow, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, but it really does, each season kind of brings its own challenges and brings its own exciting tasks to take on. Um, right now, we're just kind of gearing up for Memorial Day. I can't believe it's already next weekend. And that is our official recreational season start. Um, my, see, my unit, because we have the leaf peepers for the tower within Penwood too, um, we actually start a little earlier and then we end in November. So our season really does go from May 1st until November 1st, but um, our pavilions open up, swimming will open up at Strattonbrook in Memorial Day, and then all of our bathroom facilities will open up next weekend too. So right now we are just prepping for all of that. Um, and we just make sure that we're just keeping everyone safe and having that they can have a good time out there. Um, so during the season, we'll make sure that the parks are mowed and cleaned. That's kind of what my seasonal staff does the most. We make sure all the trails are taken care of. We do a lot of trail work. And then we also have um, our interpreters do a little bit more of the education. So we have a nature center at Strattonbrook where we give, um, there's a lot to do there. There's scavenger hunts, activities. You can actually check out beach gear and have like your kids um, play with some shovels or go catch some fish with nets. And so we do that all summer. And then you can also, we do storybook reads and we're gonna be focusing a lot this year on bear education, if you guys can imagine. Um, so we'll be teaching them how to kind of make sure that their trash is put away, that their bird feeders aren't out and just making sure that everyone's being safe. Um, at the tower, when you go up to the Hubline Tower, please ask our interpretive guides questions. They love the history. They've been working there for a while and they're so excited to talk to everyone about it. And I have one girl up there who will literally answer every question about the tower you would ever ask. So think of some tricky ones when you go up. Um, and then when you, we also have created activity books for the Hugh Line Tower. So make sure when you guys go up there, you grab an activity book. And so you guys can kind of do them on your way back down, or it's a nice gift for the kids to kind of keep calm too. So um, our work doesn't really end once the season's over, we shift gears. Um, not one day is not busy. During the winter, we work on repairing damaged equipment, hazard tree work, we complete larger projects also, which that was the majority of my summer for anyone who knows that Penwood has been closed for the last three weeks. Thank you so much for being patient. Um, we are finally opened up. We have repaved that access road into Penwood and it took a very long time, but it was very overdue. Um, we probably should have started doing it around 15 years ago, but we are very excited that it's done. And I'm so excited to be part of this history of the park. Um, when we were, we ended up doing a lot of tree work to make sure it was safe for vehicles and for the construction workers. And so I spent majority of the winter digging trenches, which again, did not think I was gonna learn how to do. And I did. Um, so that was absolutely amazing, but that project is done and we are hoping to open up the access road in two weeks. I'm just waiting on speed bumps. So this way they will drive at a slow pace while they're driving down the road. Um, we also did add 20 extra parking spots to the park. So now you won't have to fight over the 15 that are there and then park on the side of the road. You actually hopefully will have a parking spot when you get there. Um, we also have some projects going on at 
RO Farm Scenic Reserve this year, where we'll be doing some work on Cider Hill Road. And then up at the tower, Hubline Tower, we will be doing the observation deck windows this year. So that will be a very large project. Keep a lookout on social media and our website because we will be closed. The tower will at least be closed for a couple months during that construction. And then over at Strattonbrook, we actually repaved the top parking lot in Simsbury, which was a project I tried to slide in as quick as possible because the pavers were already coming for Penwood. Um, and I was able to get it approved and it went very well. So now Strattonbrook has a brand new parking lot too. Um, we definitely are just working hard with what we have. So again, Eric was talking about how we don't have a lot of full-time staff. I'm lucky to have three full-time staff um, in our unit, me and my two maintainers. And we work really hard to make sure we're keeping our park safe and clean. And if you guys have any questions, please just put them in the chat or ask after, or just call the office. We would love to talk and answer as many questions as you have. Thank you so much for inviting me back today and thank you for listening. Can thank I say you. One more thing, Sarah, before yeah, absolutely. Um, questions. Yeah. And it's really just to, to recognize uh, Stephanie. So, I, you know, I've worked for, um, you know, the last 15 years at CFPA and have worked with a lot of different park supervisors. But I, I can tell you that um, we are really fortunate uh, in the Penwood unit to have Stephanie because she has just the best attitude, um, <laughs> the best optimism, the best willingness to take on challenges. And also she's really good at organizing and getting things done. So I just, you know, I, I hope people will um, appreciate, give extra appreciation when, when you bump into Stephanie out, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the real world and just know that she's doing amazing work. And so, you know, big thanks to you, Stephanie. And Obviously, it's really nice uh, that, that folks uh, signed in tonight to hear a little bit about the great things you're doing. Awesome. Well, thank you too, Eric and Hillary, for joining us tonight. I'm going to stop the recording. We'll transfer to Q and 